we get inside the minds of amazing individuals of amazing comedians amazing people entrepreneurs multi hyphens it doesn't matter what on this show it's all about the discovery and i hope that you got a good feel for what i discovered today and that's just dope energy <laughs> ladies and gentlemen you already know what this is this is gold mine Oh my God, world. First of all, I miss you. I miss you, man. And when I say that, I mean it. I don't just say I miss you just to say it, guys. I really do. Talking to you for you. It's become a, a, a real thing of joy for me, man. And and doing gold mines, well, it's now my calm. It's my calm. It's my happy. Uh, it's my reason. Because I get to talk to dope people dope people daily and i get to take those daily dope conversations and deliver them to you that's called the three d's the dope daily delivery it doesn't get better than that this episode of gold mines will be no different it won't because we got another dope mind to get into man uh and that's what makes our show special right Finding the dope people that you may be aware or not aware of, and then finding more reasons to tap into their level of awareness. And then after that, being a part of the dope train. That's what I'm hoping to do here today. A great mind, great creative mind, man. A great creative mind. By the way, my favorite people, people that love to sit, generate, create, because that's what makes the world go round. Phenomenal writer, a guy who's had a lot of success, worked with my friends, actually. And now I got the privilege of saying he's a part of my serious XM family, which is a dope energy to talk about as well. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Diallo Riddle to the show. Wow. Thank you, man. Thank you for having me on the show. This, this you know, is something beautiful. Why writing? What What is it that... um? that basically sparked the interest to say, this is going to be my career. This is what I want to do. When did that light bulb go off you, Diallo? You know, what's interesting is uh, I, I only realized recently that I've been a writer almost my entire life. Uh, mm. In the third grade, I wrote, <laughs> I was really into World War II documentaries. I, I, mm. I'm going to say it right out the bat. I am the archetypical black nerd. You know what I'm saying? Like I, just I was always using a word like archetypical. <laughs> definitely, I don't my, think my, you had my to bring my point it. on home. I yeah. bring my point on you, home. You just, I think you just nailed it right out the gate. Go ahead. Listen, my my dad used to watch all these World War II documentaries, and I was so fascinated. In third grade, I wrote a fifty-page typed uh, story about Royce Riddle, um, you know, who was a who was a black spy in Nazi Germany. And by the way. My third grade, I never explained how a black man could infiltrate Nazi Germany. That that part didn't even come into play. <laughs> but the fact is, he was sneaking into hotels and he sneaked into Hitler's hotel with the with the antenna on killing him. And um, I wrote this up, and my father was so impressed. He like sewed this like cover onto the book. I, you know, it's still somewhere in my house. But you know, he's so. And I gave it to my teacher, and they put it in the school library. And I remember thinking at the time, like wow, I'm published, you know? So like little moments in a child's life like that uh, can lead to a lot. So for the rest of my school term, I always thought of myself as I'm the guy who's, you know, a writer. And, and you know, I thought I was going to go into nonfiction. I went to Harvard University. That's where I met my writing partner, Bashir Salahuddin. I grew up in Atlanta. He grew up in Chicago, both, both on the South side, you know, like I was Southwest Atlanta. He was South side of Chicago. Like we came from like working class, you know, slash broke families. Uh, but, you know, we put a high premium on, you know, what we were what we were into. And he was into theater. I thought I wanted to do nonfiction writing. You know, I was at the Kennedy School of Government, you know, writing papers and, and articles for the Kennedy School papers. And uh, but then at some point I graduated from Harvard and didn't know what I wanted to do. Mm, and okay. I moved out to L.A. where I had extended family. Now, I grew up in Atlanta, but my family's lived in California since the early 1900s. In fact, 1907 is when uh, I trace my uh, my paternal grandfather moving out here. He was a preacher in, in rural Ohio and something brought him to Pasadena uh, at a time when black people couldn't even live in Glendale. So they had to all live in Pasadena. And uh that was uh, I'm a person who's really into like ancestry and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so no, this is it's interesting. Like you yeah. just talking about like tracking down your reasons for why I'm loving it. Go ahead, keep going. No, no, no. Okay, so yeah, without without going too deep into it, I, I moved out here. My sister was doing some work in casting, and you know, I I basically got bit by the Hollywood bug. I loved the 
I love the industry. I love the weather. You know, I was just like, you know what? I think I'm going to stay out here and I'm going to try my try my hand at this. Okay. Um, I supported myself by being a DJ. I was DJing at the Standard <laughs> Hotel, you know, every week, several times a night, several times a week. Uh, but I was, you know, I was writing and, and Bashir, you know, moved out here uh, shortly thereafter. And he started writing. And my mom, I'll never forget this. My mom was like, you guys are so funny. Why don't you guys try writing together? And that oh, wow. was your you mom. Know, so your mom suggested it. My mom suggested we, I remember she, you know, again, we were broke. So like we would go over my mom's, you know, my pop, my father had just passed and um, mom was like always making us meals, you know, at her apartment in Park La Brea. So we would go over there to eat for free, essentially. And I'll never forget. I had a, I had a plate of half eaten chicken and she suggested that we start writing the stuff down. And I was like, yeah, you know, me and Bashir, we used to always keep people laughing at the lunch table back at back at college. Why don't we try and do this? So mom, rest in peace as well. Like, you know, she she threw out that inkling of an idea that we and that was actually when I stopped doing nonfiction writing. That was when I was okay. like, you know what? I'm going to use this sense of humor and write some stuff with Bashir. At that time, it was just Bashir will act and I will write. And I will, I'll never forget, we we formed a sketch group and there was one part that like we brought in a whole bunch of actors to do this one role and nobody was nailing it. But, you know, Bashir and I knew how we wanted it delivered. So I did the role and I got out there at the Hudson Theater on Santa Monica Boulevard and played this one part and not, a room full of 99 people laughed at me. And I was like, OK, that now now I got the acting bug, too. So, you yeah, know, so that you got hit with the combo pack. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The combo by pack. the way, by the way, that. That sketch group is uh, we're going to have to do a, a, a reunion one day because that sketch group was nobody was famous. Nobody had done anything. But the people in that sketch group were me, Bashir Salahuddin, Robin Thede, Wyatt Sinek. Wow. Uh, Nika King, who plays Zendaya's mom on Euphoria. Yeah. Uh, and Nefertari Spencer. It's like no at the time, like nobody had done it. We thought Wyatt was the superstar because he had written on one season of King of the Hill. You know, like we were like that dude's made it in hollywood but like that was that was our very first sketch you know company and uh everybody have you guys so have you guys went and reflected like is there any you guys haven't like just uh tapped in and simply just talked about how crazy it was where you guys used to be to where you guys all find yourselves at you now it's crazy so it was 2005 we didn't even really have smartphones in 2005 mm -hmm. so like mm -hmm. the only footage we have is of one show and that's it, that is so grainy. <laughs> like it is grainy. You can barely tell the difference between me and Wyatt, you know, in that footage. Um, everybody kind of went their own way in 2006. And by 2007, Bashir and I were doing web videos online uh, with Robin. We, we stayed in touch with Robin and, and Nefertari. Um, you know, Robin, you know, Robin worked with me um, uh, on Real Husbands of Hollywood. Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's. And she, she we, we always knew Robin was a star. I'll never forget her audition. She came in with that big laugh, like, ah! you know, and like we were immediately like, who is this? Who is this fool? You know, so we we spotted that right off the bat. I'm, I'm so proud of that group. I think one day we will get everybody's schedules in line and I'll make sure everybody's still cool with everybody because, you know, people like people like to go out with people after, you know, whatever. And I, well, that's, I that's sure a story. Cool. I want to make I just sure feel like that's a great story within itself. You know what I mean? Like you, you guys just hungry, just, just hungry 20 year yeah, olds trying to yeah. make it in the business. Yeah. Trying to figure out the, the way in trying to figure out what the next thing is like that. There's, there's nothing more exciting than the, the young group of creators because you're feeding off of one another. Right. I and always tell that to people. I always say whenever people are like, Oh, how do I bring in the business? I'm like, the, the key is not getting a meeting you know, with Kevin Hart or, or, you know, like people who've already, the key is to work with people like at your level, you know what I'm saying? And like to hone the craft and get good at it. And then at some point, one of you will blow up and then, you know, assuming that they're not terrible people, <laughs> they'll be like, yo, you know, who else is great? That person mm -hmm. who's, who I've been working mm -hmm. with, and like everybody lifts everybody else up. You know what I mean? Like, that's why we continue to work with, and, and by the way, still real good friends with Robin. I think that, you know, everybody is always thinking like, oh, you know, who's really good at that? Nefertar. Oh, you know who might be good for that? Yeah, but sure. Like, if you think about the people you came up with, you should really, you know, try and work with them in, on when one of when one of you blows up, because <laughs> inevitably somebody does. Who 
inspires you? What What are the writers um, that have like inspired you? And even when you're talking about writing and acting and the combo pack of it all, right? Like that, like that, that wheel doesn't stop when you got the the bug of create. It it doesn't like stop no. there. You you're not plateaued. It spins off into directing, and you know after that the expansion goes so far past that to where you're creating an experience, and it's like you're whatever it is that the vision that the vision like feeds off of is what you find yourself wanting to execute on. So who do you feel like in today's time um, acts as a major inspiration? Of like, wow, they're opening up new doors. I love what they're doing. Fan of their work. Like, <laughs> God, that makes me want to do more. Um, That's a great question. Um, Let me take a step back and say that the reason why Bashir and I came together was because we were sort of loving the same things. We loved The Simpsons. We loved... Mm-hmm. We love the Muppets and everything Jim Henson ever touched. Wow. We loved, you know, we, <laughs> I always say that we were fans of Pee Wee's Big Adventure. You know, to me, that Who was. Who was like, it? Bruh. What do you mean? It's one of the best movies of yes. all time. What are you talking Quiet. about? Like, I mean, it's the first Tim Burton movie. Uh, and my only beef with Tim Burton is that I don't know what's with him and Wes Anderson. I want them to work with black people. Like, mm-hmm. you know, because I, I, I love the, the unique vision that a Tim Burton has and the, that a Wes Anderson. I just want to see more color. But, like, w- Pee Wee's Big Adventure is, like, Paul Rubin playing a perfect character. Uh, <laughs> Tim Tim Burton directing. Um, you know, Danny Elfman did, this, did the music for that and The Simpsons. I always say music is so important. If you go back and look at the work of Danny Elfman and, and John Williams, there's music strung throughout the movies. And I feel like, you know, I, I left this part out, but Bashir and I did not meet because we were the funny guys at the lunch table. We actually met because we were an a cappella group. You know, we, we we were in Harvard's only <laughs> gospel uh, group. And it's funny because I grew up basically, you know, a little, uh, it's, it's safe to say, I grew up in a black intellectual family that was spiritual, but we didn't go to church every week. And as a result, like growing up in Atlanta, like everybody was like, oh, I like you, Diala, but you're not saved. And I was like, I believe in God. I just haven't gone to church this week. And Bashir was raised Muslim, so that was a non-starter for a lot of people. But <laughs> but we were in the we were we were in the gospel choir, and we were like, "Yo, we want to." We we got with some of the other guys who who were very religious, but we were like, "Hey, y'all, we we need to do some. We want to do some secular songs." So, and they were like, they were like, "Yeah, we gonna sound like Shy and Silk and all these other groups that are really popular right now." And so we broke off, and and we were like singing, you know, in any Boston coffee spot that would have us you know wow. but that was our first foray into performance together because you know we we were singing that we were singing if i ever fall in love by shy like we were singing all these you know we we wore the matching maroon sweaters because we <laughs> wanted to be boys to men you know like <laughs> your one yeah you know like it was just it was it was it was it was a great time but music's been there since the beginning and i feel like that was all music is always a very important part of just mm-hmm. our comedy you know that's why uh, when we ended up at Jimmy Fallon after after joining the union after the last strike, uh, you know, one of our first jobs was working at Jimmy Fallon. He had the roots there and he was like, I want funny songs for our show. And so me and Bashir got to work. We did, you know, a history of rap, which was just a medley of songs with him and Justin Timberlake. And we did and we did slow jam in the news for years. You know, we ended up doing slow jam in the news with Barack Obama, you know, uh, first time I ever got to, you know, meet you know, President Obama, which was insane and cool. And, you know, you try and well, you guys used to crush, you used to crush on that, like that, like in right. and, and that wheelhouse, when you're talking about the music integration with, with comedy, like that's where you guys as a tandem crush, like there's no, <laughs> there's no in between Thanks, and, you know, to seamlessly fit into that world of late night with Jimmy, the roots, et cetera. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's one of those things where you go, Oh, wow. I get it. And, and also, you know, that's a, that's a space where Jimmy loves to play. Like his, a lot of his success, you know, um, on SNL, you know, it came, it came from that side of the music (laughs) integration with his sketches, with, with his bits. Like I'm telling you, Questlove and Chappelle, they, they both say all the time that, uh, you know, most comedians want to be musicians and most musicians want to be comedian. In yes. most cases, you're just trying to get people to feel something. You know what I'm saying? And it's it's a it's a sort of a similar task at hand. You, you know, know what's sad most- about me? You know how many things I've had to turn down 
simply because the honest question comes up. Kev, do you sing? And I just go, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm out of here. You, you don't you, sing. You, yeah, look, you guys can kiss my ass. <laughs> Wait, Kev, Mr. Hart. But this is a great shut up. I know what the f- is happening here. Okay? You don't think I know what the f- is happening here? I don't have a melody in my f- body, but I would kill for one. Do you hear me? I would. I wonder what that is. Can you, can you not hear the note? Because I, I just, and, I feel like, I feel like even hearing the rasp in your voice, I feel like there's a singer in there. Man, not at all, girl. If I okay could tell right. you okay, I, I love you, then <laughs> you and I, and I'm not around. That's me really going for it. You just lost subscribers. I don't. Yeah, know. I just really went for it. I didn't. <laughs> that's not a bit. I want to make that very clear to the listeners. That's not a bit. That was it. And I only got that. By the way, everything I try to sing starts off with, girl, (laughs) that's it. That's the one thing that I think I have to say first to have any confidence in what's following after. (laughs) It's horrible. It's a fucking sad day. Girl is a good start word. (laughs) If I could hold the tone, it would be. Um, I love it. I love, I love how interesting you are. No, I you, right? And by the way, I didn't even answer your question because I, I started off talking about the things that influenced us then. I think the things that influence, you know, me personally now are the things that aren't, it's the things that aren't overly safe. You know what I mean? It's the things that surprise you. I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about two things from the nineties lately. And I'm like, how did that ever happen? The first far side album, bizarre ride to the far side, like, I went back and listened to it. And I was like, Holy, I think I know every lyric on this, but not even just every lyric, but like every ad lib or funny thing they're saying in the background. It's just an incredible album. And almost every joke per song would probably get them canceled nowadays. Like it's, it's definitely a function of like the light of the, of the nineties hip hop, but like, it's an incredible comedy record. It, it honestly feels like sort of a black, Monty Python album. It's it's an incredible album. And I've also spent a lot of time thinking about Pulp Fiction, which is another one that sort of came out of nowhere and sort of reinvented independent film. And I'm just looking, I mean, like this decade got off to a weird start with the pandemic and everything, but I'm I'm looking for those works of art in music and in film and in TV that are really going to set the tone for this decade. Because we got off to a weird start. It's probably off to a slow start, but the 2020s are not defined yet. And I think, you know, my goal is just to be a part of, you know, those things that help define this decade, you know, to to sort of plant a flag and say, like, this is something that couldn't have happened before. And it's really special. And and people dig it. I love it, man. I love it. I love what you're doing. I love what you're talking about. Uh, I want to go on a, to, to Marlon, man. You got to work with Marlon. Marlon. <laughs> Wayne's. Marlon says hello, by the way. I texted him, told him I was I, we were going to be talking today. That's one of my. That's one of one of the good guys. He is Marlon. Marlon Wayne's is one of my close friends, man. Um, in this business, and just an all around good dude. His is, energy man. contagious. Um, just a loving good dude. I just wanted to know, like, from that experience, you know, in, in working with Marlon at that point in his career, how was that for you? Like, what were you able to take away from that? So much. Uh, I, I could talk about that forever. I think the headline is that, you know, when people ask me, like, who's cool? You know, like, the people you've met and actually worked with, you know, extended amounts of time, who, who who's cool? Who who's? I always say, man, I would be friends with Marlon if we had never worked together because he didn't know me from any i my first time meeting him was auditioning for that show uh you know the nbc slash netflix show marlon and i went in for an audition and it went well and they could ask me for a call back but, but it's funny because this is a hollywood story i remember getting those the the audition sides for the first audition and i read it and the the lines were like hey yo marlon you gotta you gotta bust it tv or something like that and i actually <laughs> called my agent i was like hey you know i don't think i can say it like i look i'm proud i'm a proud black man but i don't think this is a character they're gonna (laughs) they're gonna want me play and she said you know what the producer specifically said diala should come in and read for it but he can feel free to say it however he would say it Mm -hmm. and i was like okay we'll bet you know this cost me nothing so i go in there and i do however i (laughs) whatever the diala version of 
yo, Marlon, you got a busted TV. I think I said TV. I, I think I said something like Marlon, the TV's broke, you know, or something like that. You know, like I said it <laughs> the way that I would really say it. And then when I went in for the callback, the lines had changed to be whatever I had said in my first audition. So as a actor auditioning, I was like, oh, they must, they actually liked what I did. And that gave me a huge boost of confidence. And Marlon's in there and we do the scene together. And it was funny. And at the end of it, he gave me a one arm hug, like a big one arm hug, like, yo, use a, f-. I don't know if we can, you can just believe it. He's like, yo, use a funny. N-. <laughs> <laughs> and all I remember thinking was, you know, like, I wouldn't use that word, Marlon. <laughs> that was literally what was in my head. I didn't know him yet. He, yeah. loves, that. he loves that word. Yeah. And, man. and, and I thought, you know what? At the worst, they'll they'll bring me in to be like a one episode character or something like that. But I got the part. And I will say that the reason why I, I really respect that dude so much is that we became friends while shooting that show and Brisha Webb and Essen Sackens and the uh, kids. Brisha Everybody Webb. on that show. Yeah, go ahead. Brisha Webb. I was going to say Brisha Webb is one of the most talented. Genuine. Like, I mean, dude. You really can't put words on it. Like she's Brisha Webb is somebody that I'm I'm rooting so hard for. <laughs> I'm rooting so hard for because she's just she's just so kind hearted, so like even kill, thankful for the opportunities. But she's good. She's good. I, you were talking earlier about like what writers bring to the table, but the fact is we could do an amazing job and hand our words off to somebody who's not skilled and they mm-hmm. will die. Mm-hmm. I feel like she's one of those people you could literally hand her the phone book and Breach is going to sell it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like she's going to bring all that good energy and just funny to what you know you hand her. It's just incredible. I, I can't agree. And, and by the way, Essence Atkins brings so much <sighs> in her own way. She brings like gravitas and funny and experience i mean like she she could she could could knock it out on broadway she can do anything essence is polished what do you mean she's she's so 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 polished and we all this space i I just say we we all just stayed friends through the shooting of that show and afterwards there have been times in my life (laughs) when i have made the foolish decision to go out with Marlon, you know, to one of these nightclubs. Oh. <laughs> yeah. But then yeah. I'll get a but then I'll get a, a a talking to the next day like, look, man. Yeah, you know, like he's been famous for three decades. You know what I mean? Like it's just one of those things where like he's been he's he's been on screen since he was 14. Like he will literally pull you aside and, and, and give you like knowledge and the ropes and like marriage advice and all kinds of advice. I just feel like he's one of those people who who takes care of the people around them. And if, and if he thinks you're slipping on something, he will call you out on it. And I just always appreciated that. Like he's, he's the ultimate big brother, even and, though he's, and, even though he's the he's, youngest brother in that family. He's <laughs> getting old, but his energy has not budged. His, it's it, like, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, you know, when he goes, I'm said years old mm-hmm. and you're around him and that, and laugh and energy and the will and want to do is is insane, man. He's you know that that family in general, man. I'm I'm such a fan of them, Real. their their work ethic, and and their their level of love that they put on display for the world to see for one another. It's it's inspiring. Can I can I tell you though <laughs> a funny story about you and him? So one Absolutely. time he Please. was like, "Yo, D, come with me to Vegas. We gotta go see." Canelo and Triple G <laughs> and we're on the tarmac and I swear to God uh, we get on he's like we're gonna take he said something like we're gonna take a private I think you know this gets a little bit in the weeds but it wasn't a private it was a small plane but it wasn't mm-hmm. but like our plane had to sit there and wait for your plane <laughs> <laughs> to move and Marlon was heated he was sitting there like yo we gotta wait on Kevin Hart's plane <laughs> it was it was, you know, you just never think about that kind of stuff. It's like as a, as a as a kid who grew up wearing one sweater to school, like we had no, man. we had no man. I, it never occurred to me that there were like, <laughs> I don't want to call it levels, but like Marlon was heated. He was like, tell tell Kevin Hart to take off, man. <laughs> He's probably not gonna be happy. I shared this thing. Yeah. That was the first oh time God. I was just like, oh man, oh, <laughs> Kevin, this is Marlon. Great. <laughs> You Marlon, man.
talk to me about your show that you have that's been uh that's been going on and and of course like i said you're part of the serious xm family but you know just what's the world of it give it to me uh you know, again, music has always been, you know, a key factor in not just my comedy, but just in my life. You know, all my earliest memories are tied to music. You know, my father had a jazz record collection of about like 3,000 plates, uh, <laughs> plates being DJ talk, you know, about 3,000 records. And um, just going down there and listening to, you know, all that jazz and, you know, Star Wars soundtrack and the Beatles and everything else, like music's always been there. And I've always found it's a way to connect with people. Um, what our what our show one song is actually about, and shout out to my collaborator on that, a uh, guy named Luxury, who has a very popular TikTok uh, account which breaks down songs like you know he'll say like oh you know this song is an interpolation of this song you know okay. this, this song sampled this song and this person didn't pay you know <laughs> this person didn't pay the license for that song so they got sued like it's it's really fascinating stuff but I think at the end of the day if you like music every episode of one song we take one very popular song from any decade it could be rehab by amy winehouse it could be let's go crazy by prince we take it and we break it down to just its, its fundamentals you know what i mean like we say how it got recorded what were some controversies so about it we talk about the bass line and the keyboards you know like we we get really deep into it the wonderful thing is that often we have like what they call the stems on the song so like we'll we'll bring up like oh you know that that lyric everybody met well the problem is is that the background singer was really loud on that part of the song and here's what they actually are singing you know like we we comb through we start off with a list of almost like 300 songs we cut it down to 100 and right now we have like a list of 50 songs that we think are interesting and fascinating you know to talk about not just even just about those songs but like the world that gave birth to them and the way mm. that they affected the world so mm. you know we can talk about protect your neck by Wu Tang and the and the effect that that had on you know hip hop in the '90s. We can talk about you know Stevie Wonder Inner Visions and the and the, and the effect that that had. Obviously, there's going to be some you know there's going to be some Marvin Gaye in there. There's going to be an episode about one of the Beatles songs. But I think that what I have found is that music is a great common you know connector of people, mm -hmm. and and we're going to talk about songs that people you know. Having the, we're going to talk about some some songs you may not. Uh, one of our episodes is all about Montel Jordan's "This Is How We Do It," and how a song that sampled Slick Rick became like the ultimate. I mean, <laughs> party, you know, like weddings, bar mitzvahs, movie trailers. You know, well, I mean, you don't. This doesn't stump me. Like this is the second <laughs> thing that you said, and I'm like, duh. When you said <laughs> Pee Wee Herman, and you're talking about how great Pee Wee's Big Adventure was. Yeah, it was. Great. I'm talking about Montel Jordan. Not only that it was a sample song, but how big of a fucking hit it was. You should be breaking down this song <laughs> because that song is legendary. It's an immediate classic. And we need yes. to talk about, you know, six four, did he stand? Six eight, did he stand? Like we're gonna we're gonna break it down and talk about everything about these songs. And by the way, we want all kinds of people to live. We have an episode about Juice World. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. yeah, we have stuff for the young, stuff for the old, but everything in between. And the cool thing about me and Luxury is that we actually are pandemic friends. We're people. I was watching his videos during the pandemic. I finally hit him up. I was like, dude, I just want to say your videos are cool. That is all. He was like, hey, I've been I've been watching your show Southside on, on HBO Max. I love that show. Wow. And then we just started going back and forth and eventually we traded like actual phone, you know, phone numbers. And then we would find we would talk on the phone for like. I would always be like, oh, I have a quick question for you. Just give me five minutes. Of time. I'd look up, be two hours on the phone. And then <laughs> and then at some point I did like some work with Snoop. And then I think some people reached out. They're like, hey, would you like to do a, a show about music? And I was like, yes, but only if we can bring this guy luxury along. Because I find that like he knows about the stuff like he knows about like Pink Floyd. He's a white guy. He knows about Pink Floyd and some stuff that I don't know about. That's, and I that's, a, like, good, that's a great match. Yeah. And I feel yeah. like I and, I and I've I've been able to teach him about 90s hip hop and and the way that that gave way in the 2000s to to the Neptunes and Just Blaze and Kanye. Mm -hmm. And so together, I feel like we've got everything from like, you know, 1955 Elvis songs to, you know, 2023 Lil Uzi Vert songs. You know, I think we've got everything in between. And uh and, and just because I've worked in this business for a while, we're going to also be hopefully bringing in some of the people that we've worked with. That's everybody from, 
you know, more is day in the time to Drake. You mentioned Southside, right? Yeah. Great segue. Uh, what was your feeling on, on and how the show ended? Like, where <laughs> where are you at with that? We are so proud of that show. Look, we, we would love to. It's There's always a chance that someone gives us a chance to do a season four. But in today's mm-hmm. environment, you know, a, a TV show that gets three seasons is not a fail by any stretch. You know, no. what I'm like, that that's, what that's a good, healthy run. And and when we shot that last episode, we obviously didn't necessarily know that we weren't going to be coming back for a season four. But I feel like we we went into it thinking, yo, let's make sure that this is the perfect, you know, the perfect ending if it turns out to be that way. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, we, we never assume anything is promised tomorrow. So we were like, let's make sure that we leave it all on the table. So, yeah. You yeah. know, I feel like, look, season one, I think was fantastic. I think season two and season three, we even took like some major swings because we moved from Comedy Central over mm-hmm. to HBO Max. But I always say that's a show that has never lost a fan. And I've mm-hmm. heard people say, you know, I, I hadn't, I had heard good things, but I was like, let me just watch the pilot. They ended up binging the whole <laughs> series, the whole, not the season, but the series in a weekend. And that's because we put a lot of time and effort into breaking stories that that's a term it's it's the opposite of what it breaking stories in our business means to uh to write and to craft you know the best possible story we spent a lot of time making sure we didn't do any episode that we had seen on another tv show and i think that's why some of the episodes go in really unexpected so it might start you know at a but then the very next scene is at an at a g you know what i mean like we never wanted to do something that we'd seen. The quickest way to kill something in the South Side room was to say, you know, I've I've seen that before. You know, oh, you know, Blackish kind of did that. Oh, you know, Atlanta has an episode like that. Like, you know, it didn't even have to be black shows. We could be like, oh, you know, Mr. Show, Bob and Dave. Uh, they did a, they did a sketch that's kind of like that. Like, we didn't want to do anything that had been done before. And I think that that show is testament to how hard we put into the actual storytelling. No, man, listen, you know, that's, uh, it's amazing just you talking about the following and a fan base of that show because, you know, it's, it's earned, it's not given and making the transition from a comedy central to the world of HBO Max. I mean, dude, it's dope as hell. And to your point, three seasons of a show in today's time, that's a hit. That's a hit. That's and a by hit. the way, I, I feel like it was more than three seasons because we had to jump through hoops just to get, to the first season we shot a we shot a sizzle reel which to to people outside the industry that's like a proof of concept that's when you take your own money and you just go out and you try and Mm -hmm. shoot something we Mm -hmm. shot a 15 minute proof of concept that we gave to comedy central they were like we like this now let's shoot a actual pilot we shot a pilot we turn it in we were sweating then they were like okay so now you can shoot this and it's like that's what got us to the first season but i'll even take it a step further back because before that i know you know tim story yes story very well so Tim Story, actually, when we were still writers on Jimmy Fallon, we pitched a show to HBO in, tw- in 2011. And they were like, yes, we love it. Let's let's try and make this show. And we shot a pilot in 2013. I still love that pilot, but HBO rejected it. But they were like, we're going to give you <laughs> essentially one more chance. We hired Tim Story to shoot a, a pilot that I hope one day leaks to the Internet because I'm so proud of. It's called Brothers in Atlanta. And Brothers in Atlanta, directed by Tim Story, was basically us doing a show about two guys in their 30s who are way too old to be trying to be a DJ and a rapper. But we were in Atlanta and and we had Jaden Smith and Maya Rudolph. And I can get into the Jaden Smith of it all because that's a very interesting story, too. But we'll save that for another day. Um, I'll I'll just put it like this, you guys. when we shot that pilot, we had originally wanted T.I. to play the the thug next door. <laughs> like mm-hmm. our guys lived in one house and clearly they were living next door to a to an actual Atlanta style trap house. And we wanted T.I. to play the role. But our casting director said, what if we got what if we went non-traditional? What if we got Jaden Smith to play uh-huh. the, the head of the trap? And I was like, OK, that's cool. Mm-hmm. So we got Jaden Smith to play that part and he killed it. But we had another part for like a famous rapper who came to the house uh, who was just friends with the guy around the trap house and everybody we reached out to everybody was unavailable or, or busy. And then she was like, well, you know, what if we got uh what if we got August Alsina to play uh, that, you know, the rapper, the, the rapper or singer who's wow. at the trap house. We're like, that sounds cool. So August shows up on set, him and Jaden have never met. 
Wow. And we were like, August, this is Jaden. Jaden, this is August. And I think your your listeners can probably figure out wow. why. I was like, wow, we had a hand in history from that little show, Brothers in Atlanta. Wow. Wow. The cool thing about Brothers in Atlanta to me was that that was the first time we were like, we're going to do a show that's going to be very specific to our our backgrounds, our upbringing. Like in Atlanta, we had a, you know, there was a famous party promoter who died, and we used to always joke that, man, when he died, like there was a power vacuum in Atlanta's party promoter. Uh, wow. You know? <laughs> and, and true enough, you know, we took that storyline, we made it into a Brothers in Atlanta episode. The long story short is Brothers in Atlanta never made it to air. The president of HBO got fired. His, his, the guy who came in after him, you know, he was, he was not our friend and he was like, okay. So Wipe the slate. It was going away. Yeah. But we took that same storyline and applied it to the South side of Chicago because it doesn't matter if you're on the South side of Chicago or Southwest Atlanta or South Philly, you know, or the South Bronx or South LA. I always joke that black people clearly love living South of the city. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You know, it doesn't matter where you're from. These storylines make sense. So, like, you know, the the day the Jordan drops is one of my favorite episodes of South Side. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, it's it's all chaos breaks out because the new Jordans are coming out. You know, like these were the kind of sort of like slightly heightened, but black people can laugh at them. Sort of like storylines that were like we we sort of pride ourselves on. And uh, if anything, that is the kind of storylines that we like to tell. We like to tell stories. Of, of things that kind of happen in our real life. Yeah, grounded. What do you mean? Grounded, yeah. relatable stories. Um, I mean, things that happen to you every day are, are funny enough. I'll never forget we were working with Drake one time. We were at Drake's house, and <laughs> and we were working with him on the ESPYs. But they gave all, you know, like, it was it was a party, and there were, like, there were strippers there, and everybody was, all of us nerdy writers were handed you know, f- stacks of fifteen hundred dollars to throw at the <laughs> to throw the strap. I'll never forget one of his bodyguards walked up to one of our writers. He was like, "Hey, uh, you at a two, and I'm gonna need you to get to a nine. And I wanted to be like, "You don't know them. That's that's actually them at a nine. <laughs> like, <laughs> by the way, I was broke at the time. Like, Drake, Drake's dude handed me fifteen hundred dollars. He's like, "Yeah, throw these at the girls." <laughs> and I was thinking to myself, like, I was broke. I was like. Mm. Yeah, I don't want to really. I, I was like, waste this. how do I get this fifteen hundred dollars out of Drake's house? It, I, I was like running through a heist movie in my brain. I was like, how do I get? Because this fifteen hundred could help me out of a couple of jams right now. This is like the power bill, the gas <laughs> bill. This is like our cell phone bill. Like my wife would be so mad <laughs> if she knew I had fifteen hundred dollars right now and I wasn't escaping through the vent system. Like, yeah. <laughs> It's, it's I a gotta thought. get out of here. It's a thought. I gotta get the f- out of here. There was so much crazy. money on the floor at Drake's house. I was just like, but I knew there were cameras too. So I was just like, that, that ain't gonna work. That ain't gonna work. But how do I get all this money into my Kia? That's all I could think. <laughs> I knew, but I, the up thing is, I knew the cameras was around. I knew the. I was like, you can't see them. They might be in the fruit bowl, but I know that they're there. And just to get that fifteen hundred dollars out of out of Drake's house would have changed my life. Shout out to Drake. We've worked with him a couple of times. That's a good <laughs> I don't dude. think he knows this story, but he's like, a very, I was a very funny guy too. He's a, he's a, a comedy funny nerd. Guy. He's a comedy yeah. Jimmy Fallon, comedy nerd, Quest Love. And, and the roots, they, they are comedy nerds. That's what people don't realize is that comedy nerddom and and music nerddom, again, almost the same thing. There's a lot of there's a lot of back and forth. There's a lot of overlap. So Diallo, your podcast, uh, name of your podcast, your co-host, give me the breakdown. The name of the podcast and Sirius XM show is called One Song with Diallo Riddle and Luxury. Uh, it's me, it's TikTok influencer, I know he hates that term, Luxury, and we're going to be talking about music in very funny ways, but also in very enlightening ways, and it's a great time to spend some time. Hey, do me a favor, man. Before you guys go, please don't forget to subscribe to my guy's show, man. You can do it on Sirius XM. That's right, Sirius XM. Or you can go to your favorite podcast apps. Don't miss an episode. Guys, this is talking about the next steps in in, in the world of creative, breaking down music uh, in a manner that you didn't even know it could be broken down in, infusing that space of comedy with intelligence. 
insight, etc. cetera. Uh, give it a listen, man. Don't forget, show my guy some love. That's why we're here. Educate yourself. After educating yourself, give him some follow through. I love it, man. I love this conversation. I hope the listeners did too, man. This is what this show is about. It's just <laughs> about real dialogue, real authentic dialogue. We had that today with Diallo, man. Diallo, man, I want to congratulate you on everything, everything you're doing. Um, sure, more bro. importantly, man, I want to echo it again. Uh, I support you. I support the world that you participate in. Um, and I love the fact that you're doing a lot, man. It's just getting started. As a guy that's working and as a guy that's doing what you love to do, I'm telling you, it's just getting started and it's only going to get bigger. And I can't wait till we crack the code on the bigger things for you and I. We're just uh, getting started. Yeah, we got to do it, man. I know. We're just getting started. So um, the combination of you and 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 Heartbeat, Laugh Out Loud, and the relationship, of course, with Sirius XM, these are all things that I think. Are, are are lining up right and we've tried to do things and those things didn't work out in the earlier stages but they're setting us up for the back half of the they'll, they'll happen when they're supposed to happen absolutely hey as, absolutely. A, as a father of three I, I would be remiss if i didn't tell you this so you know how you always that question always comes around if you could have dinner with anybody living or dead who would it be yes i i asked my kids that recently and my 13 year old my oldest son my 13 year old i was like who would you have dinner with living or dead who would it be uh I kid you not. He said, Kevin Hart. And wow. I said, really? And wow. he was like, yeah. He was like, I just think that he would make me laugh so much. So there you go, man. <laughs> man, that you know what? It doesn't get better than that. Shouts out to you, son, for making my day. Right? For <laughs> making my day. Uh, listen, man, this is Gold Mines. You know what we do here. We get inside the minds of amazing people. And today was no different. Diallo, thank you. Um, until... We meet again, my friend. And trust me when I tell you, we will. It will happen when it's supposed to. Uh, just do me a favor, man, and don't f*** this up. It's been going good for me so far. All right? <laughs> Nothing but hot takes. Yes, Nothing sir. but hot takes now. I, I love it. All right, champ. Take it easy. Thank you, sir.